Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our virtual meeting. And today we are going to be focusing on the topic of reopening schools. I'm Michelle Ekstrom and I'm Director of the Education Program at NCSL. And in advance of getting started, we've asked you to type into the chat box what state you're from and what is the biggest concerns about reopening. And we're getting lots of great feedback about your concerns, everything from overcrowding to containing the virus to um, the social distancing requirements. Um, how do you manage the spread? How do you plan for all of the different contingencies? So um, hopefully we'll answer some of those questions and if not, for sure, have a good discussion about your particular concerns. So just a reminder about the protocols for today's meeting. Um, if you are joining us by phone, um, we'd rather you join us by video, so please do so. And also be sure to turn on your videos. We'd love to see your faces. It's good to see everyone participating. Um, also, please add your full name in your tile so that we can see who's joined us for security purposes. And you can do that by clicking on the three dots in the upper right hand corner. Also, be sure to keep yourself on mute unless you are speaking. If you would like to speak, you can either unmute yourself or you can also virtual, virtually raise your hand as well. Um, there will be times, as we did at the opening of the meeting, um, where we'll ask you to type your questions into the chat box so that we can pose those to our speakers. And we also just want to remind you not to share your own um, screen at any time during the meeting. Just a reminder too that the meeting is recorded and it will be archived and publicly posted on NCSL's YouTube channel as well as our uh, meeting website. So for today, we are going to be hearing from two phenomenal speakers. Um, Dr. Sarah Lee from the CDC will be joining us to discuss the guidance that they have provided and then we will also have AFT's Randy Weingarten to talk about their guidance that they've been issuing and their concerns about reopening and um, the things that we should be thinking about um, from AFT's perspective about teachers and kiddos as they head back to the classroom. Um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and then we will also give you a preview of the final few meetings that we have coming up in this series. So I'm going to launch a poll and um, what we're going to be, oh, actually I'm not gonna be doing the poll because it says the polling is inactive for some reason. I don't know what's going on. Um, what we'd love for you today, what my question was about is how familiar you are with your guidance that um, has been issued within your own state. Do you know where to find it? Do you know what the guidance says? Do you know whether or not it aligns with um, the CDC guidance or the guidance from AFT or CCSSO or any of the other groups who've been launching guidance? So we'd love for you to think about that. And then at the end of the meeting, I will have some resources available where you can find that information and familiarize yourself if you are not familiar with your own state's guidance. So today, as I mentioned, we will be joined by Dr. Sarah Lee. Um, she's team lead from, uh, for the research application and evaluation team with the School Health Branch at the Division of Population Health at the CDC. And so with that, we will go ahead and get started and invite Dr. Lee to make her presentation. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thanks to all of you for having me this afternoon. considerations and really get to hear from all of you what types of questions you have. And can everyone hear me? I'm seeing this message that I'm muted. Yes? Okay. <laughs> um, and, and just um, listen, you know, being able to listen to the conversation and the, the challenges and concerns that I see already in the group chat are 
very real and we've been hearing those as we have conversations with school districts and state departments of education and um, counties and different communities. So I'm going to give a hopefully high level overview um, about the considerations, but also really talk through what we're, um, we're, we're really discussing of this layering approach of mitigation strategies and talk about how does that layering approach really apply to the considerations that we've published. So before I get into that, I think one of the most important things that we, all of us know and so many other people across the country know and realize even more so is how important um, and how fundamental schools, teachers and administrators are to our country. And with closures, it also was so critical to ensure that students continue to receive their education, um, receive school meals and other types of services that are essential to the growth and development of students. And we know that actions by every state and people and, and communities across the country have certainly helped flatten the curve across the last several months and helped save many lives. So as we talk about and move toward reopening, we all want to do so thoughtfully. And I just even by the, the questions and comments I see within the chat, as I mentioned, that is absolutely what's happening um, with the conversations we're having as well. Very thoughtful questions and, and discussions. I also think it's important to acknowledge the complexity of this situation that we're all in. And today I'm only focusing on schools, but there are so many other aspects within your states and communities in terms of reopening and doing it safely that so many of us are grappling with and that um, we need to consider. And we also realize that there are no easy answers to what we're all challenged with. Um, before I dive into the details of the considerations documents that we've released, I also just wanted to note that as of today, we have over 2 million confirmed and probable COVID-19 cases and tragically over 115,000 deaths in the United States. So in order to continue to address um, COVID-19 and the unfortunate outcomes that happen with the disease, there are two specific strategies we can turn to that slow the spread of a respiratory virus, such as coronavirus. So first, of course, are pharmaceutical interventions um, like vaccines and therapeutic drugs, and then community mitigation, which is the focus of my presentation today. So before getting into details about each type of mitigation strategy. One of the things I wanted to share is how CDC usually frames community-based interventions. We usually group those into three different categories. The first is personal protective measures, and that can include hand washing, covering coughs with a tissue, and using cloth face coverings. The second would be community measures that promote social distancing and canceling larger events and gatherings. And then the final one, falls under the category of environmental measures, such as cleaning and disinfection. And I know with many of the conversations that we've been having with different communities, school districts, states, that many of the plans or the things that they're considering and how to address include these three categories. So as I mentioned, we recently released uh, considerations documents that outline ways that people can protect themselves, their families, and their communities and slow the spread of COVID-19. These considerations are comprehensive resources that outline effective mitigation strategies in detail. So on this slide, I've provided a list of the documents with their cor corresponding website links. And of course, today I'm going to be focusing on the considerations for schools. Within the document on the left side in the outline, you can see um, that's essentially the format, the organization and the layout of the considerations documents. And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into each one of those. Um, one of the most important things that we talk about when thinking about these considerations is that school administrators and officials should continue to consult with state and local health officials to determine how to put these into place. Schools may also need to make many adjustments to these considerations in order to make, meet the unique needs in their communities and the circumstances within their district and school. Um, the implementation of these mitigation strategies and their actions that are listed should really be guided by what is practical, acceptable, and tailored to the needs of each community. And I think based on some of the um, comments in the chat, 
it's, it, I think there are some themes that are common across um, many of your states, but there are also different issues that are pressing for you and that are the biggest priorities. And that's really important to take into account when looking at the CDC document. It's, well, how does this meet the needs of our school community, the schools across our state, and even district by district? So we really want to stress that they're meant to supplement and not replace any state, local, territorial, or tribal health and safety laws, rules and regulations um, that you all have um, established. So Michelle, can you jump to the next slide? This is my, um, my only other slide. And I've been um, really enjoying how we've laid this out to really talk about not just what are the mitigation strategies that are within the considerations documents, but how do we talk about them and how do we look at those um, in terms of combining them together or layering them, as we say. Um, we know that successful mitigation involves stacking best practices. So bundling or lay layering those successful mitigation strategies together to reduce the spread of COVID and lower the risk of another spike in both cases and deaths. So if you take each of these interventions alone, like social distancing, frequent hand washing, cleaning and disinfection, and the use of cloth face covering, um, that confers some protection. There's no doubt about that. And we also know that if you implement many of these strategies together, that will really make a difference in school systems and larger communities. So within the considerations document, we focus on these layers of mitigation strategies to help address COVID. The first layer of protection, and I'm going to go a little further into each of these, is about promoting behaviors that reduce spread or things we do at an individual level to protect ourselves and those around us. The second layer um, of protection is maintaining healthy environments. Next, there is the main maintenance of healthy operations. And then finally, is the need for preparation for when someone is sick within any of the settings that we've covered for considerations, in this case, schools. So in addition to layering the mitigation strategies, I also want to touch on levels of risk before I dive deeper into those four um, layers, basically. Um, within the considerations document, and it sounds like many of you are really familiar with the document, or at least somewhat familiar, at the very beginning, we do have um, details that outline the level of risk. Um, and the risk of COVID-19 spread in schools, we've laid out as follows. So the absolute lowest risk is if we stick with what happened in the spring for most schools in, in most states, right? When students and teachers engage in virtual only classes, activities, and events. There is no in-person um, instruction or gatherings. You add a bit more risk um, when you convene small in-person classes, activities, and events, um, groups of students or cohorting of students, and teachers staying together throughout and across the school days and not mixing the cohorts um, or trying to minimize that as much as possible. Students maintaining social distance and then not sharing um, objects like school supplies and equipment. And then the highest risk is full-size in-person class activity, activities, gatherings, and events um, where students aren't spaced apart, they share uh, materials and supplies, and there's mixing of those core cohorts of students. Um, I don't want to give the impression that it's not possible to hold in-person classes in schools. There are just a multitude of actions that can be implemented. And again, going back to what the needs are um, and the unique circumstances of your communities is really, really important to think about what um, ways you're able to lower risk. So let me talk about each of these a little bit more circling back to the layering of mitigation strategies. Um, schools can definitely play an instrumental role in, in encouraging the promotion of healthy behaviors that we talked about, that first layer that reduce the spread. And one of the things that's important in a, in a role, I think, that multiple lever, levels of society, whether it's local, at a school level, it's at a district, it's at the state, um, is educating everyone within that school building, staff, students, and families about when to stay home if they feel sick or have symptoms. So many of you have students or have had students in school. I have a child in middle school and one in elementary, and we get regular um, messaging from our schools about these are the reasons we need you to stay home 
um, if and when you're sick. And I think this becomes even more important given the status of COVID-19 in our country. Um, in addition to that is teaching and, and reinforcing healthy hygiene. So I think overall, we see some of that happen anyway through health education within our schools. Um, it becomes even more important when this is one of the strategies we must have and must use um, to protect ourselves is that teaching and reinforcement of healthy hygiene, the frequent hand washing and showing how to wash hands um, adequately and properly and how to cover coughs and sneezes. Another piece within this um, promoting healthy behaviors is the supply issue and having enough hand sanitizer as, as well as soap or soap, I should say, paper towels, tissues, and cleaning supplies. The other piece, it's when appropriate, and we know that this is um, raising a lot of questions, is the use, use of cloth face coverings when feasible. And if you choose to do that and reinforce it, a lot has to be done to educate folks about how do you wear them, what about washing them, when to wear them, who should not wear them. And we know this is a fairly complex issue, and perhaps many of you have questions about the cloth face covering um, guidance. And then the last piece of that layer is posting signs, making announcements to reinforce those measures that I've just outlined. So it's that constant communication and reinforcement of those um, protective behaviors. So adding on another layer um, can include schools implementing processes and policies to maintain healthy environments. So this includes engagement from all aspects of the school environment in terms of um, staff, teachers, um, and others working within the school setting. So cleaning and disinfecting frequently touch surfaces, especially those high touch surfaces, uh, door handles, sink handles, uh, light switches, and drinking fountains. It is important at this point to really discourage sharing of items that are difficult to clean or disinfect. Um, ensuring ventilation systems operate properly and can increase circulation of outdoor air as much as possible. So for example, if it's feasible within a school to open windows and doors to allow some fresher air to circulate, we know that this can be helpful in mitigation. I know some of you mentioned the aspect um, in the group chat of social distancing and the challenge with that. Again, looking at what's feasible, what is possible to be able to do in a school with this layer of mitigation related to social distancing. The recommendation says modifying such as um, spacing desks six feet apart or having students only sit on one side of the table spaced apart that might not be that full six feet, but there's still some distance. Uh, many of you have seen, I'm sure as you've gone to uh, run errands at a grocery store or a pharmacy, signage, tape, um, other suggestions for where pe people should flow um, through a store and where they should stand when waiting for checkout can also be done in a school. Just gives those prompts and constant um, reminders to students, um, staff, and teachers. So in some cases, it's going to be important to close shared spaces such as dining halls, um, otherwise, it's important to stagger use if that's not feasible and clean and disinfect between use by groups of students. One of the things we discussed, and we've had a lot more discussion even since the considerations came out, was providing alternative options for food service. We know that schools across the country have become champions in the last few months in finding very creative solutions to ensure that students continue to receive meals when they're not physically in the school. So, we're talking a lot lately to states and school districts about ways to continue to be creative and develop and share innovative practices that can keep students safe while providing essential services such as school meals. All right, moving to the next layer um, of mitigation is actions to maintain healthy operations. So the following actions that I'm going to go through fall under this category. The first is consider offering options for staff or students who are at higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19. That includes um, older adults and people of all ages with certain underlying medical conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, and chronic lung disease. For staff, uh, many of you recognize, and this is also one of our discussion points we've been having over the last few weeks, that this might include telework or modified job responsibilities. And for students, it could include virtual learning opportunities. 
pursuing virtual group events instead of in person and larger gatherings, meetings, and field trips. Um, being mindful of how you might need to adjust physical education and organize school sports will also be important. When possible, what I referred to um, a little bit before um, this, this layering strategy was that reference to cohorting of students. So if possible, identifying small groups and keeping them together. This keeps students and staff, um, students and staff groupings as static as possible by having the same group of students stay with the same group of staff all day for younger children. And of course, as much as possible for older. We recognize that becomes much more difficult in middle and high school. Staggering scheduling, for example, when students are dropped off and picked up. Um, designate a staff person to be responsible for leading COVID-19 communications and concerns. And that's something we found really important. If the school identifies that one point of contact, it really helps that that communication funnels through that person and activities are, are coordinated um, and led by that person with a team. Sick, flexible sick leave policies um, are also likely very important to enable staff to be able to stay home when they're sick um, or have been exposed or are caring for someone who is sick. The next um, piece is unfortunately there still may be times when a staff person or even a student may get sick. And we know that this happened in some schools across the country before um, widespread closures occurred. So it's really important to continue to have a plan in place for this. As I noted, it's really important that schools educate staff, students, their families and others about when to stay home, how to notify the school when sick with those types of COVID symptoms and when they can return to school after recovery. Another action under this mitigation strategy is to have an isolation room to separate anyone who has COVID-19 symptoms. You might not know at that point if they actually have COVID, of course, but really important to be able to separate them um, from other students and staff. School nurses certainly play a critical role within this um, specific mitigation strategy as do other healthcare providers that engage with school districts and schools. And they should use standard and transmission based precautions that CDC has outlined um, for healthcare providers when caring for sick people within the school environment. It's important to immediately separate set staff and children with COVID-19 symptoms um, and try to get them to go home or to a healthcare facility as soon as possible. Cleaning and disinfecting areas used by a sick person is really important. And if possible, wait 24 hours before cleaning and disinfecting and allows um, the virus to dissipate during that time. In accordance with state and local laws and regulations, school administrators should notify local health officials, staff, and families immediately of any case of COVID-19, while of course maintaining confidentiality in accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and informing those who have had close contact with a person diagnosed with COVID-19 to stay home um, and self-monitor for symptoms. So what I've shared with you over these um, two slides and the deeper dive into each of these layers of mitigation strategies are actions that schools can consider. As I mentioned, it's going to be difficult work over the next couple months um, for all of you and other decision makers at other levels within your states to figure out how to operationalize these actions in your schools and communities to meet the unique needs and circumstances across your state, which may vary from, as I mentioned before, may vary from um, district to district. These are unprecedented times and protecting public health is paramount um, while also, also not losing sight of the other impacts that ha have happened because of this public health crisis. So I just wanted to end there. Thank you all for all that you are doing and leading across your states. And I look forward to the conversation for the rest of the hour. Thank you so much for that information. Um, my gosh, there's so much for schools to think about <laughs> and for school district officials to be preparing for and for teachers to prepare for. Um, so right now is your opportunity to type in your questions or unmute yourself to ask any questions of Dr. Lee. So I'm just gonna give you a moment to do that. 
And as you're doing that, um, I, I do have a question. Um, as you were talking, it occurred to me, I had not thought about the fact that um, it sounds like your guidance would include school nurses maybe to be in full PPE when they're dealing with students that potentially have COVID. And I just, I, that's just not something I had thought about before. So I wanted to um, circle back with you on that point and see if that is what you were saying. Um, it is, and as I mentioned, the documentation that we have on CDC's web website, the standards of care and what healthcare professionals use, that is what we refer them to. Uh, and we had a lot of discussions actually with the National Association of School Nurses um, really since the beginning of um, COVID-19 and getting input and their, you know, thoughtful comments related to considerations and other documents that we've put out. And that, that is where we landed within the considerations document in terms of PPE. That's interesting. It also makes me think of how so often those kiddos come to the office. And so those front office staff um, would be the first line of little kids who don't feel well and then they send them to the nurse's office. So just thinking about all the different ways that schools have to um, restructure the way that they typically do things and the way that they would communicate if they're not feeling well. Um, okay, well thank you so much. So right now at this point we are going to um, transition over to Randy. Um, for many of you, Randy needs no introduction, but I will go ahead and do so anyway. Um, Randy Weingarten is president of the American Federation for Teachers, AFL-CIO, which of course represents uh, teachers, paraprofessionals, and school-related personnel, higher ed faculty and staff. And I think one thing that we forget is they also represent nurses and other healthcare professionals as well. I know a lot of the work that you all do has been around healthcare at this moment and certainly in response to um, to the hurricanes and, and otherwise. So welcome Randy, we are so thrilled to have you and um, let's go ahead and get started. I think you might be I, unmute. I know, I think I just unmuted. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so let me, um, and um, it's good to see all of you. And let me, you know, we, we have on our website um, several things. I'm sure we've, I'm sure Chris has gotten it to the participants who are here. We have the plan to reopen um, we have um, the hundred, I call it the $116 billion document that we put out last week. And I'm glad that um, CC, um, the, the, uh, the Council of State Chiefs are going to um, uh, put a document out about that as well. Um, you have probably an uh, op-ed that I did in the Washington Post about why we should try to use summer to test some of these ideas um, and a uh, very long q and I did with the uh, editorial board of USA Today. Um, and that was all, yes, I'm teasing. That was, you know, that's all been since um, uh, the, the beginning, the end of April and the beginning of, of uh, May. And I just, um, I want to make a, a a few points here because I think um, uh, our CDC speaker so um, completely, you know, covered a lot of the nuances. Um, I feel like I don't have to do very much of that. I want to just, um, uh, you can see that what we have here is um, both a public health crisis that schools are going to have to deal with in the absence of a vaccine and several other crises that will really affect children and teachers and parents as they walk back into school are affecting them right now. That is the economic crisis, the recession, and that is also 
the justice crisis of that that has been with us since for, since 1619 but i think for the first time in what many of us and i often feel like i've been alive since dinosaurs have roamed but i think that with the protests that we're seeing right now and with this generation of of students and young adults that we may be at a tipping point where the issue of treating people regardless of who they are and what they look like um, um, and who they want to be with, that it is not okay to treat people in a discriminatory, in a different way. And this is not a matter of some bad apples, but this is really, really systemic. And that racism is systemic and treating black people and brown people discriminatorily is systemic and it has to be dealt with. All three of these issues, my point in talking about all three is that they're gonna show up in the reopening of schools. And, and, and anyone who thinks otherwise is smoking something. And so this, this has made what we need to do in August and September even more complicated. So number one, I normally start with the public health issues, but number one, I'm gonna start with, we have to think about next year as a bridge year. As a year, it's not gonna be a regular year. It's gonna be a bridge year where we're gonna to have to figure out where kids are and how we help create safe, supportive um, environments for them and how we also ensure that we can meet their instructional needs, their well being needs, and their instructional needs. So we have to keep them safe physically and we have to meet their instructional needs and well being needs. So that, that's why I and so many others are saying stop the standardized test for next year, too, not just for this year, but the next year to really try and figure out how we do formative assessments and we meet kids' needs. That's number one. Number two, we're gonna have to deal with how you marry, and you just heard the CDC talk all about it, but how are we gonna marry all the public health needs and tools with um, the instructional and well being strategies? And that if we don't actually deal with, as a threshold matter, the public health tools then we're basically gonna be on remote instruction for the whole year. And that's gonna get me to number three, which is it's a disaster for kids, particularly for kids um, who are poor and, and for whom um, remote has not worked as well as, as, as one would have hoped. Um, so I go back to the, 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 the public health tools there has to be some clear sense that you can't skirt on the sort of physical distancing and you can't skirt on the cleaning a school really, really well. And so the work that Dr. Lee put up at the end in terms of those kinds of things are really important. To me, there's five of them. There's what's the how do you get kids into a school? What is this screening? Plus, what happens if somebody's sick? That's number one. Number two is what's the physical distancing? Number three is what's the other PPE issues, including masks, who wears them and when? Number four is the personal hygiene in terms of washing hands sanit um, and, and hand sanitizers. And number five is the cleaning the buildings every day. That's going to have to be part of any kind of schooling, and that's going to cost money, and that's going to be disruptive. The third piece I wanted to say was that we have to that 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 this is going to cost money. Whether you're talking about the summer learning loss or the other learning loss whether you're talking about the, um, the PPE costs, the bus costs, all these other things, 
it's going to cost money to be able to do this and school systems are strapped and that is why frankly for us the number one priority has been to get the magnitude of funding that is in the heroes bill um, into school districts and into states frankly the more people start modeling the more the numbers the higher the numbers are and i think that the chiefs are going to actually have a higher number than um, we are going to have and number four we got to talk to people there's a lot of distrust about thank you there's a lot of distrust about how schools closed um i live in new york um school should have closed two weeks beforehand in new york but even more than that the fact is that americans are not stupid and you could see from everything that was going on in China, at least what we knew, that if we had gotten some more measures of understanding about what was going on in China, in Europe, there would have been a lot more preparation. And instead what happened is that school districts and teachers, sorry, and teachers in particular basically um, had to build the plane and fly it at the same time in terms of going to remote education and all of that in terms of the issue about the digital divide in terms of grab and go meals there's hundreds of stories about what was done but the but the but there's a lot of skepticism that given and frankly our first press conference on coronavirus was february 2nd where we basically said we need more information on what to do long term, particularly if this is really a crisis. But so, so this moment of time to prepare, but also to consult in a real way to create credibility with parents and with teachers is really important. So there's a lot we have that things are going to screw up. There's a lot we have to do, but we really have to focus on kids learning and mental well-being as well as the public health tools that these three crises we are in make that clear number two we got to marry the public health tools and get them right number three it's going to cost money and number four we got to do more than consult and tell there has to be real credibility and partnership between parents teachers and um and um students the last thing I'll say is there are models out there that we can use. They're starting to be lifted up. I have some of my favorites myself, um, but that will come and during the question time. Thank you. Um, it was so great to hear your perspective on this. So as a reminder, you are able to type your questions into the chat box for Randy, or if you have additional questions for Dr. Lee, go ahead and type those right in. Um, and as you're doing that, I have several of my own. Um, so you had mentioned the impact of um, the learning loss. And I know this has been a big concern for state legislators as well. This is something that's coming up a lot, knowing that the access to learning was not um, was very disproportionate and was was not great. And um, knowing that especially students with disabilities or English learners or others who struggle generally just didn't have a great experience or didn't have an experience at all. Um, how do you envision teachers being able to assess that learning loss right away to figure out how to meet those kiddos needs at the beginning yeah. of the school year? That's a really good question. I think we have to actually integrate the learning loss and the well-being issues and think about them as, this, as, as the same kind of issues. And so I think what we have to do is in, and Linda Darling Hammond has made this suggestion as well, we have to actually think about September as a time for formative assessments, not a standardized test to figure out where people are, but a formative assessment within the new constellation of, of whatever that class structure is. So like in some places, some schools are thinking or some districts are thinking, 
um, just for sake of argument, that say you have 150 kids in second grade, and say you had five teachers for the sake of argument for those 150 kids, how you think about all the teachers and all the kids together, and you know who's on remote, you know what you can think about it as, you know. Uh, how many kids come into school at the same time versus how many don't. Um, you know, you, some schools may say, okay, this is the remote teacher who's always going to do remote. These are the teachers that are going to be in school. You can have some, and, and so there may be classes that are only remote. There may be classes that are only in school, or you can have what I'm hearing in over in crowded districts that you may have a staggered schedule of you know, um, three classes on A schedule, two classes on B schedule, and the teachers, and, and then the teachers are responsible for both who's in school, the 12 kids who's in school, but also the 12 kids who may be on remote. So once you end up having the constellation of, of kids with their teachers and kids with their kids, so, so you have, who do you have for this year? then you can start thinking about how we do formative assessments and how you kind of assess where each of our kiddos are and what their needs are. And then, we, and then how you deal with it then going forward is gonna be some of it will be a school level, some of it would be CBOs, some of it will be school nurses, some of it will be guidance counselors, some of it will be instruction. There are some really smart teachers that I've been working with in New York City who basically have said, look, maybe we should think about the way in which we deliver instruction as how we would do it as if it was remote, and then we do reinforcement in terms of in-school. But the reason I am really, really pushing on making school schools reopen is because, you know, white suburban kids may have been able to do just fine. But if you don't, if 40% of the kids in New York City didn't have access to digital, if kids who have special needs didn't really do well in terms of that, we need to actually see our kids and be able to see them. I, I don't mean that, I mean this, um, see them, feel them, understand what's going on with them. And, and, and what we had last year that we don't have going into this year, and the last thing I'll say on this, I'm sorry I'm so emotive on this, is that last year we had them for seven months. So when we went on to remote, we knew who our kids are and the kids knew each other. And so we actually had real relationships with them. We start this year without them, which is part of, without those relationships, which is part of why it's so important to have some face-to-face. -face. So that's why I'm saying next year's really a bridge year. We're gonna have to do formative assessments in September to see where our kids are, and then we're gonna meet, have to meet their needs. And there may be some shuffling in terms of which teacher is gonna then be responsible for what. Thank you for that response. That was really helpful. Um, I have another question. Um, about uh, the impact this is gonna have on the teacher teaching profession. I know we've seen some estimates on the potential loss of positions. I know I've been reading articles about teachers wondering if this is the time to retire or um, just feeling like they aren't properly equipped to teach in this environment. So I'm really curious what your perspective is on the economic impact on teachers and also the social emotional impact on teachers. So, um, look, I can't say enough about how teachers responded in the last several months. Nobody, you know, no, no one was prepared to move their entire teaching for three months onto remote. And that's separate and apart from everything else that goes along with this. And, and, and the fact is, teachers rose to the occasion all the time, all over the place. Um, I'm often asked, well, you know, doesn't collective bargaining, uh, you know, hurt in this situation? In this situation, collective bargaining really helped because where you had a union that was strong and that was working with an administration, 
you were getting support from both sides in terms of how everything that was, uh, was, uh, was um, thrown at people. And so teachers actually have become much more adept at knowing the good, the bad, and the ugly about remote than frankly any tech person in Silicon Valley because they've actually had to go through this right now. We need to tap into that knowledge in a really intentional way. So that's number one. Number two, a lot of people are scared because you know there's you know the, because there's not enough that's known about um, about COVID yet, um, other than you know um, that that people who get sick when they're older um, have um, gotten seriously ill. Um, but what we also know is that there's been a huge disproportionate impact on black and brown communities. So it's not just people who are older. There's been a big impact um, uh, where, um, on, on black and brown communities as well. So people have, you know, the armchair experts have been saying, well, if you're 65 and with asthma, look, I feel very personal about this. I'm 62 and with asthma. If you're 65 and with asthma, you know, maybe you shouldn't go back to teaching. And frankly, we need to actually have some real guidance from, um, from, from the doctors who have been dealing with this, as opposed to just what we're hearing from Donald Trump or somebody else on TV. And, and that's gonna, and unfortunately, because the feds have not done as, as great as Dr. Lee was today, the feds have, have come up with lots of incoherence we're going to have to have a reasonable accommodation for people who are in various different groups of risk. Um, and, and given that there's so many things that people can do, that reasonable accommodation may be remote. Number three, the biggest issue and the thing that will actually stop schools from reopening um, and being on remote all next year, which will actually harm the economy, not just harm kids, I frankly think about it as harming kids more than about harming the economy. But if you, if, if, if we, if given the magnitude of the cuts, if you've got 20% of cuts, which is what most states are talking about, you're not going to be able to reopen schools. We didn't have 20% of cuts in the 70s fiscal crisis in New York or in the 90s fiscal crisis in New York or in the 2008, 2012 fiscal crisis in the United States. You had about 10, maybe 15%. 20% is a huge cut, and it's going to disable um, school systems from opening up effectively. And what it also does, if I can go back to what happened in the 70s fiscal crisis in New York, you lose a generation of people. You, you lose a generation of teachers. You lose that kind of, of, of wisdom. You lose a lot of sense about can do. You lose um, you know, lots of different things. And so when you see it already, uh, we already have 750,000 layoffs of educators in K-12, you know, since the beginning of COVID. So the fact that the um, Senate refuses to do something about it, I don't get it. I don't get what they are thinking because this will be the loss of a generation. It's not just summer learning loss. It's not just digital issues. It's going to be the loss of a generation. And, and it's just really, really, really pathetic. So are teachers scared? Yeah, they're scared. Are they skeptical? Yeah, they're skeptical. But frankly, by and large, they have hearts of gold and they have risen to every occasion in this last few months. Um, Dr. Lee, do you wanna weigh in here on um, the risk to teachers and how teachers could think of minimizing that risk? Sure, thank you. Oh, sure. Pop back on my video. <laughs> um, I think just to add to that, in terms of minimizing risk of spread of um, COVID, is that I think I shared it early on in my talking points about having health education lessons regarding um, hand hygiene and those personal protective practices is going to be really important because as teachers being in front of all of those students, <laughs> they 
are, you know, have a greater risk, but the large group who might come to school sick and really do come to school sick, regardless of what it is that they're sick with. So even though I think schools by and large do the best that they can and teachers are equipped in many cases to be able to teach about hand hygiene and um, covering their coughs and sneezes, I think it will be really important to not just let it be one or two lessons in the school year, but a constant reinforcement, because that's one way that they'll be able to really protect themselves um, as teachers. And one of the other things that we've been getting questions about is what is really the feasibility about cloth face coverings for teachers and how, how will that really, really, really play out in a classroom? How is that going to impact students learning um, if they and their teachers have to wear those. And again, we, we completely leave this up to um, local districts and communities to determine where they land with cloth face coverings. And we also know that that just might impact teaching and might impact learning in a way we don't want it to. Um, but I think when you're talking about, as Randy was mentioning, teachers who have other um, existing comorbid conditions that put them at higher risk and are more vulnerable. They really, you know, really having that conversation and determination at that building or district level is important about those protective measures. I'm looking at Randy's dog. <laughs> Sorry, the dog, uh, Penny wanted to be part of the conversation. So my apologies. <laughs> um, and the last thing I would say is really looking at the role that they can play, and it's like adding another thing um, to teachers' plates, which not necessarily what we're trying to do or say, but they do play a role in the cleaning and disinfecting within their classrooms, at least. And we definitely had a lot of questions about, can teachers teach students how to clean and disinfect appropriately? And while that would be ideal, we do not recommend that for probably many obvious reasons for us, right? Um, but I think those three key pieces and, and strategies that, that teachers continue to use and implement within their classrooms and with their students will be really critical to minimize risk. I also think that Dr. Lee is right. And we, we have, look, we, you know, in years gone by, there used to be a lot of hygiene lessons within schools. And, you know, ultimately, if we can actually teach kids and ourselves how to wash our hands effectively, that's gonna be, I think, helpful in the long term for lots of different reasons. But you know, I've heard people talk about if we could really do the social distancing or the physical distancing in a classroom, then the only time that people would have to wear, or kids, for example, would have to wear masks could be you know, as they were moving in a hallway. Um, say we could actually get masks that have, you know, that are clear. Say we can have masks that have, you know, where you're able to breathe a little bit better. I'm, as I said, I'm asthmatic and some, and I've gone through various different kinds of masks to figure out what I can use that's very helpful in terms of breathing. But I, I do think that if we're, we're going to know a lot more um, in, um, in, in about what logistics work um, as, as people try different things, even over the summer, and as people try things um, in September, and, and figuring out a clearinghouse in terms of, 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 of really listening and working with people is going to be the best thing that we can do. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I, we, we were just on a call a couple of nights ago with some folks from Pennsylvania more of a local community. And we really stress that cloth face coverings are likely not feasible all day, every day on every teacher, student, staff, and faculty member within a school. And so are there critical times where we would want them to be worn? Like Randy said, walking into a school building in the morning where there are large crowds convening and bottlenecking down the hallways or moving to from their classroom to physical education where you're all in the hallway with other classes doing the same thing. So some of those types of scenarios are, again, probably more, more realistic and feasible um, if, if cloth face coverings do 
um, get implemented in your school? I will say it's my, my kids' biggest concern. <laughs> <laughs> they're not sure about school generally what it's going to look like but I've gotten the question a million times do we have to wear masks to school <laughs> I don't know I don't know <laughs> well thank you both so much for spending time with us today um, thank you for sharing your dog with us Randy uh, we were just having a conversation right before you got on a legislative staffer from Oregon had her cat with her you yeah. we were saying it makes it so much more fun <laughs> um, to see people's pets and to you know, it seems so real. These Zoom meetings are just, you know, people are real. You get to see their houses and their pets yeah. and so forth. So thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to share with everyone a few resources. Um, these are a couple of the resources that AFT has put together. Um, the first is the guidance for reopening school. And the second is the cost of reopening schools. This is a conversation that's really heating up. Um, um, some folks are saying we don't understand why it's been so expensive. We don't understand what the expense is gonna be going forward. So um, um, AFT and a couple of other organizations are starting to put out estimates of what they think it's gonna cost in this new environment. And so what I, I would encourage you to visit those resources. And then I also wanted to share that NGA just released just this last week, a great document um, uh, that tracks all 50 state plans for reopening um, childcare summer camps, camps in K-12. And if you are unsure about where your state is or what the guidance is, please um, feel free to visit this resource, hop on and those, uh, the lettering in purple are actually hyperlinks. I would also mention too that um, the Southern Regional Education Board is also putting together a K-12 education recovery task force. They're not, they're not just putting it together, they, they've assembled it. And they're putting together a playbook um, that I think will be really helpful, particularly for the SREB states. And then they are helping each particular member state with guidance on reopening as well. So SREB is a great resource for that too. So again, thank you for both being on. Um, and just a reminder of the upcoming last three virtual meetings that we have in this series. As many of you know, we've been doing this series since the beginning of April. So we're gonna conclude it at the end of June. Um, on Friday, we're going to be talking about civics ed. This seems to be a particularly poignant conversation and discussion to be had right now and how we're thinking about voting and the role that different policymakers play at the different levels. You know, what does the governor do versus the legislature versus um, the, the courts and um, the importance of civics ed right now for students to build those 21st century skills. And then we're going to um, have an update on state revenue forecasts with our team at NCSL. And we're also going to discuss um, tracking the federal and state education spending um, to, to get a better understanding of where the state budgets are at and, and how we, what we know about how those federal dollars are being spent. And then we're going to end the series next Friday with a discussion about evidence-based policy making and how it's more important than ever to be thinking about digging into research and information that's evidence-based um, so that you can be making the difficult decisions we know that you all face. If you need anything else from us, please feel free to reach out. And I think that's the bell indicating it's time to wrap up. So we're going to wrap up and I thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, ladies.